Berger is the author of The Resonance Saga, a space opera trilogy set in the distant future of the Milky Way. As C.E. Berger, her middle grade Choose Your Own Adventure, Sisters from the Multiverse, comes out this October. She lives an academic life in New England. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, so I'll be reading from the first chapter of First Light, which is book one in the trilogy. Chapter one. It was just behind her sternum, in that part of her chest that felt the most sheltered, where she could fold in on herself if she needed to. That was where she neatly wrapped the images of gore, the coppery smell of blood, the sensation of stepping on lifeless limbs. That was where she pictured storing it all away when her job demanded it. Lieutenant Commander J.M. Mill had seen enough violence and bloodshed in her 14 years of service that this part of her was carefully cultivated. It was a place of darkness, sealed away behind a will stronger than the alloys of the armor they wore into the field. Rarely did the door crack open and let the darkness out to sicken her. And it wasn't the destruction around her that left the way open today, that allowed the clammy tendril of fear to wrap around her insides. It wasn't the body strewn across the colony. It wasn't the smell of their rotting flesh, ghostly and faint, and perhaps only a trick of the mind after her suit's filters had scrubbed the air. It was the voice that sent a chill through her. Beside her, Lieutenant Salman Ozma picked his way through the bodies that had piled along the corridor, abandoned there once the gurneys and temporary beds had been packed two people deep. The emergency lighting still cast a flat light on the carnage. It had happened so fast. They didn't understand yet what it was, but they understood its purpose. That was clear before Jaya and the rest of the Avalon's company had set foot on this colony. The group that claimed responsibility for this attack called themselves the Sons of Priam. They claimed that if only by raising the old could they right the wrongs of the galactic powers and bring about a new world. Their leader, although he kept his name and his image from the propaganda they broadcast to the farthest reaches of Union-controlled space, spoke with a dark power. And his voice. It wasn't a particularly terrifying voice by most standards. It hadn't been altered to produce any effect, and yet it haunted her. Slightly breathy, with the rich timbre of the lowest notes of a flute, it made the tiny hairs on her forearms stand on end. Something in his voice tugged at her subconscious and dug into the deepest secrets in her mind and pulled them forward. Jaya crouched down, removing one of the sterile kits from her pack. This was as good a place as any she'd already passed to take samples. The hospital had been the first on this colony to send out the alert a mere 20 hours ago. The quickest of the victims had come straight here the moment they fell ill. Most had not been so fast to assume the worst. And as Jaya took in the white-walled corridor heaped with putrid corpses, she thought, perhaps those who had waited had been better off. It was all over so fast. Every human and alien resident on this colony dead before the first relief ship could arrive and the military could quarantine the area. At least those who had not sought medical, medical attention had been able to die at home, surrounded by loved ones. Corporal Elias Thompson's voice came over the comms. The implanted communicator in Jaya's ear broadcast his voice crisply, the fidelity so good she could hear the tears in his throat. She closed her eyes, wishing she could grant him some privacy, but they had a job to do. His older brother had been on Yangtze, one of the other colonies hit. Just yesterday, Thompson had been bragging about how the wages he sent home had allowed his brother to invest in new equipment for his farm, how bright his future would be. Jaya understood the loss of a brother. Her own brother's disappearance remained a jagged wound in her heart to this day, more than two decades later. But her family was one of those secrets the voice had stirred up, and they were roiling dangerously at the front of her mind right now. She held them close, her own private grief and fear. No one moving on the third floor, Thompson said. Infrared says the bodies are all cold here, too. There are some offices, though. Thought Sal might want to have a look. Good work, Corporal, Jaya replied, sending Lieutenant Azuma to you now. She looked back at Sal, who nodded and began to pack up his own testing kits to join Thompson on the third floor. Roger, Lieutenant Commander, Thompson said. Hey, Mill. Rhodes' voice broke through on a private line. Lieutenant Commander John Rhodes was Jaya's counterpart, leading his own small strike team through the government buildings just a kilometer away. I'm listening. We're about done over here, he said. Are you ready for Exfil? Not quite, Jaya replied. Head to the rendezvous point, and we'll be there when we're done. Asma's going to hit the hospital computers and see what he can find. You get anything good? Negative. No sign anyone saw this coming. We'll have the Quants work their magic, but it's like this place was cursed. You can say that again. Okay, we're headed out. Meet you at the RP. Rhodes signed off and left Jaya in the silence of her biohazard suit, crouched over a body. A sudden wave of grief rushed up in her, tightening her chest. She swallowed it back down and took a, a deep breath, closing that door. There would be time later. 
She took her last sample and checked her palm drive. The tiny computer implanted in her skin was wirelessly connected to a control panel on the wrist of her suit. She brought up a layout of the hospital, displayed as a three-dimensional holographic map. Two dots on the third floor showed her where Sal and Thompson were located. A third dot roamed the outside of the building. That would be Jordan Vargas completing her perimeter check. The corporal was uncharacteristically quiet today. The team's internal channel was usually raucous with banter between Vargas and Thompson, but today there was only Jaya's own thinking to occupy her mind. Jaya interrupted the silence. Alpha team, report. On my final sweep, Vargas's voice was still brash, although without her usual swagger. I've checked all the floors, Thompson confirmed. I'm on three now with asthma. This hospital's data security is a fucking joke. Jaya couldn't help but smile. That would be Sal. His sharp edges hadn't softened at all in the ten years she had served with him. I take it you'll be done soon then, she replied dryly. Download in progress, Sal said. We'll have all the automated data, but I'll be shocked if anyone in this hospital made any notes once the crowds rolled in, and considering they were sick too. He paused, and Jaya finished sealing up the sample bag while she waited. Long gaps in the conversation were also typical of Sal. She could picture him now, his dark brown eyes narrowed at the screen in front of him, his previous train of thought suspended indefinitely like a hung code until he finished whatever had distracted him. So we won't have much in the way of on-the-ground description, but we should have lots of data to process. Could find a pattern, Sal concluded. I've got everything I need. Time to go then, J Jaya said. Brava team is waiting for us. She switched to the master channel. Avalon, this is Alpha One. Mission accomplished. All part participants accounted for. Bravo team is at the RP and Alpha team is en route, requesting exfil. Lieutenant Lupo is on her way in the shuttle, Alpha One. The Avalon's captain, Peter Armstrong, replied, in a, his voice warm and determined. We're expecting you. Come on home. Thank you, Captain. The rendezvous point was half a kilometer outside the capital, but Arcadian Gardens was a tiny agricultural colony, and calling the capital a city would be generous. It spanned less than two kilometers north to south. It was even shorter east to west. Its population was a few thousand, nearly all humans. While other colonies boasted thriving multi-species populations, agricultural colonies like this one weren't a draw for residents from any of the other civilizations of the galaxy. Outside the capital, agricultural compounds swept along the curve of the planet, and the remaining 60,000 citizens of Arcadian Gardens lived there, managing the crops that they exported to richer colonies and stations in the United Human Nations. Or used to. Preliminary sweeps showed a cold and desolate countryside. No heat signatures, no living beings, human, alien, or livestock. Not anymore. It hadn't been all that different from the colony where Jaya had spent her teen years. Her gut tightened, and she had the sudden urge to call her uncles. They reached the rendezvous point in short time. Bravo team stood in the wheat field, four figures shrouded in bulky suits, stark against the daylight in this empty world. Approaching RP, Jaya announced, We see you, Alpha team, Rhodes replied. Ready to go home? Very. A rush of air buffeted their suits as the shuttle descended. The wheat in the field compressed and rippled, the only motion they had seen in hours, as Lieutenant Lin Lupo brought the shuttle gently down, opening the airlock aperture.